This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the LG G5, LG's flagship Android smartphone for 2016 in a mainstream size. Who knows, maybe there'll be a bigger one later on. 5.3 inch display here, and a new metal back, a new metal everything, which is something shocking for LG, who used to do the shiny plastic stuff. The one thing we didn't really like about it was it was either shiny plastic or weird textured rubbery back plastic. This is actually metal available in four colors. However, there are a few drawbacks there. And the most interesting thing are the friends. This bottom section here actually yanks off. You press a button and to release it, like so. The button's right on the side there. You grab it. It's nice if you turn the phone off before you do that because you're taking the battery out. Here's the battery right here. There are other friends as well. There is a camera module that really is just a camera grip and a zoom wheel. And it has a little extra battery besides this one. Now here's the even more complex thing about the friends. You, when, you, when you take this off, you actually have to take the battery off of this, which is pretty firmly on here, yank it off and stick it in the other friends. The other friends, uh, and sometimes it's not good to have friends, I don't know, are the camera module that I mentioned. And there's also a audio DAC, audio amplifier, Bang & Olufsen, so you can get high resolution audio. That's it for the friends that actually work with this internal slot right here. Beyond that, we have flagship specs inside and a whole lot more. We're going to look at it now. So here it is, the first, a metal body for LG. Uh, there are imperfections, though. You can almost see how there's a little bit of lumpiness, bumpiness there on the back. It's actually a primer paint coating on top of metal, which isn't the greatest idea. We'll go into that later. The display is QHD, 5.3 inches, so a little smaller than the LG G4. And as usual for LG, off-angle viewing, it gets dim pretty quick, but front viewing is pretty nice on it. We have the Snapdragon 820 in here, the latest and greatest. 4 gigs of RAM, 32 gigs of storage, of course a removable battery, and a micro SD card slot. Okay, uh, some reviewers have given this phone a hard time and kind of hated on it a little bit. Uh, there's a lot to like here. We're going to talk about what's to like first. First off, very nice QHD IPS display. It's 5.3 inches, so it's a little bit smaller actually than the LG G4. This new modular friends design, I, I think, caused them to enlarge the whole casing and design and make room for those removable bits. So th there's the reason there. LG says that they have increased the max brightness to 850 nits. Now that is on auto mode only when you're something like outdoors. Right now we're indoors on manual max brightness because otherwise it actually want to run dimmer. So it still tends to want to run dim on auto brightness. Some people have complained that uh, they thought that there was a lot of light bleed and I think some units must have that problem. Ours does not. Again, we're running on max brightness. Let's choose a pretty dark background right here. And I'm just not seeing any kind of egregious light bleed here. It's absolutely fine. Now, we may have the lucky unit here. We may not. I don't know, but this one is good. Off-angle viewing, as always for LG's IPS displays, isn't among the best. Um, for something that you do tend to pull out of your pocket and use at odd angles, that can make a difference because things are a little bit less vibrant, and I think you probably noticed that earlier in some of the, the pictures that we had. Not the end of the world there, though. But if you do compare it to Samsung's Galaxy S7, the competing flagship here, you can see that it does have better viewing angles. And of course, that AMOLED color saturation, too, depends on what you like. Uh, that said, this is one of LG's more saturated IPS displays. I always thought the LG G4 looked a little bit mm, not too exciting in the color department. This one is actually pretty nice and reminds me of the LG V10. Speaking of the LG V10, here it is. Certainly a much larger phone, and you can decide. They don't, of course, they don't have exactly the same pictures on which display you like better. I'm leaning a little bit towards the LG V10 there. But the V10 has a rubbery plastic, interesting and grippy and durable back here, which is a lot different from our new all metal design. This is available in silver, what's called Titan. That's what this is, which is kind of a warm, darkish gray or gold, you can get it in gold, and pink. You might want to call it rose gold, depending on how you feel about it, but it's pretty much pink. Pink's not available yet. The, the kind of rounded, humpy back camera reminds me a little of the Nexus 6P, which we have here, also a much larger phone. For those of you who don't like phablets, this wouldn't be the phone for you, but, well, that's up to you. This also, the, the LG, reminds me a little of the Nexus 5X, the more affordable phone, and in fact the whole contour design here is real similar, of course the fingerprint scanner on the back. By the way, I'm not always a big fan of fingerprint scanners on the back. This one doubles as the power button. It works very well. Been quite pleased with that. 
Notice there's two cameras here. Boy, it's all the rage to do multiple cameras, right? One of these is the same 16 megapixel camera we had on the LG G4 with the Sony sensor image stabilization, auto HDR, 4K video recording, all the nice bells and whistles there. And I guess you could say that they did pretty darn good with the LG G4, so it's okay if they didn't try to move forward with that camera. And, you know, it's nice to see them try to milk a little more performance out, but they've added on an 8 megapixel wide angle camera on the back here. It's the secondary camera, and it's 130 degree field of view. It's extremely wide. For those of you who shoot with uh, digital SLRs, that's sort of like using an 18 millimeter lens. It's extremely wide. And so you can see the difference. This is shot with the regular 16 megapixel camera. And you, we're not going to spend a lot of time going over the camera because, again, it, you get in the LG G4 camera again. And it, it is a very, very good camera. Lots of detail, natural looking, manual modes, nice stuff. Now let's switch to the wide angle mode. Whoa, right? Look at that. So it's, you might think it's a parlor trick when you read about it, but I think this is actually kind of pretty neat. And it's useful if you really want to capture your surroundings and give an almost panoramic VR feel, it's very easy to do. And if you go on the camera application, it's not complica complicated at all to do it. So here we are in the camera application, and you can see the single tree means normal view. And if we do the wide view, whoa, there's a whole lot of extra stuff there showing, huh? So you get the idea, but that's obviously quite easy to do. Switching between video and photo right there, accessing your settings. You can go into manual mode, set your shutter speed manually switching your front and rear cameras. The front camera is 8 megapixels. That's a pretty high resolution front camera. It also is a pretty wide angle of view. Now I know they do this so it's not just all about you. So you can include other stuff in the picture, give context, but it also distorts features. I'm holding it about as far away as I can there and well my poor big nose just got even bigger and it distorts your features a bit. But it, again, it, it does allow you to capture more of what's going on around you. Now, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I'll let you decide how attractive or not attractive or somewhere in between you think this phone is. Personally, I think the Samsung Galaxy S7 and S7 Edge and the, the iPhone 6S family have outdone the LG in looks, but this is their first jump and they're trying to do the premium metal, so I'll cut them a little slack. I do like the curved glass here that kind of just melts into the frame. That looks very nice. Very thin bezels on it on the sides and not even too much on the, the top and the bottom. There is a metal chamfer here. Uh, I suppose it provides a little bit of contrast and it provides some grippiness. Ours is not sharp. I know some folks have gotten ones that are sharp. In fact, I went to the local store and I felt several of them and some of them actually were a little sharp. Not like they're going to cut you, but not really comfortable either. Uh, it seems like LG does need to improve a bit and we're going to get into the not so great parts of the video review if you can't tell by now. You got your volume control here. That's all perfectly normal. This is your friend release button to pull out the bottom chin, which will power down the camera because the battery is affixed here. No matter which friend you're using, there's going to be a battery in it. And this side's pretty clean. You got a little pokey hole to get to the nano SIM card slot and the micro SD card slot, compatible in theory with cards up to two terabytes. They don't exist yet, so LG has to say it's in theory. USB-C port here supports quick charge 3.0. You got speaker grills right there. Speaker audio is okay on it. Headphone jack is up top and it has an IR blaster, something that has disappeared from Samsung phones but is still here so you can control your home AV gear. One of the things that I question is the fact that LG decided to cover up the antenna lines, which other manufacturers, including LG in the past, have managed to actually integrate kind of nicely into the design. Let's bring in our Nexus 6P again. And you got these little stripes on here. Samsung does something similar. It really isn't egregious. It looks okay. Well, LG thought that they were not attractive, so they decided to take the metal and cover it with a primer. I don't think it's a good idea ever to paint on metal. Dyeing metal is fine, uh, infusing it with color, but this, I don't know how durable it's going to be if this is just going to scratch off. And it gives it a plasticky look, and it's not made of plastic, so that's kind of a shame. But the antenna lines kind of do rear up and just a barely a bit here on the chamfered edge. And at first you see that and you think, oh, I scratched my phone or there's schmutz on it. So that's kind of, you know, well, not my best design choice. The headphone jack, also, if you look in there, it looks like raw plastic or raw metal. Of course, it would be metal. It's interesting that there is no sleeve around there to kind of make it a little prettier and cleaner. Also, maybe LG will 
get this better as manufacturing improves over time, but the, the, the primer finish is not the most even. We have a little bump right here, right near the bottom, right where it's going to meet the friend, and there's a little unevenness up here too. So it seems like it's pretty challenging for them to get the paint to adhere uniformly and to not kind of do a little bit of a run and blop. Now in 2015, we saw phones that were $300 and less that had really good fit and finish. Here we have a flagship phone that sells for, depending on your carrier, anywhere from around $625 to $650-ish or so, maybe even a little higher on AT&T. They always seem to charge more for phones. But we've got a gap here where our friend installs. And our friend is shoved on as tight as can be. Now, is it the friend's problem? Or again, sometimes it's not good to have friends. Or is it the phone's fault? It's hard to say. Now, I've looked at some other units and they had less of a gap, but I know some of you who have purchased these have complained. You can actually see light through it. I've had my fingernail get stuck on it. I've got a piece of paper here and I can stick it in this gap easily. You see how much it's going in here? That's totally not cool for a phone in this price range, honestly. And the same on this side here. And going around to the front, we've got it stuck inside pretty easily. So, uh, yeah. And now back to some good stuff. Well, mostly anyway. Inside we have the 1.6 gigahertz Qualcomm Snapdragon 820. That's the latest, greatest CPU available from Qualcomm. It is quite fast. It benchmarks every bit as fast as the Samsung Galaxy S7 running on the same processor and obviously faster than the LG G4 that it replaces. It has four gigs of RAM. Again, very competitive, very flagshipy. 32 gigs of internal storage, plus there's expandable storage too. It wouldn't be an LG if you couldn't remove the battery and you couldn't put an SD card slot. At least so far, that's the way they've rolled, right? Performance on this is good. It's snappy, it's fine. Uh, the the less awesome part is the well as ever the LG UI. I I'm not a big fan of their icons. See, I don't even know what some of these are supposed to be. Honestly, they change them so much, and they've done something that Lenovo has done on their affordable Android tablets. They've gotten rid of the home drawer, so your icons are on your home screen. Now you can go and switch to the the simple home option, which is for <laughs> no offense, but for elders. I mean, people older than me, like you know, your, your 80 year old person who really can't see very well. And then you get a more standard kind of interface, but otherwise go to the app store, Google play store and download either the Google now launcher, Google stock launcher, or the launcher of your choice. If you don't like this, having the icons right here at the root level of the home screen. Now there's been rumors that Google is actually eventually going to do this too. And obviously, you know, you still have some room for widgets and stuff like that. So it's not the end of the world. Now, in terms of benchmarks, it scores almost identically to the Samsung Galaxy S7 and S7 Edge, and unsurprisingly faster than the LG G4 that didn't even have the, the top-of-the-line CPU for its generation. There were reasons for that. We're not even going to bother with a benchmark comparison table because it would pretty much be pegged there with the, the Galaxy and significantly above the G4. Quadrant, it scored 42,057 on Tutu, 129,921. Geekbench 3, 2376 for the single core, 5505 for the multi core. 3D Mark Slingshot, 2525. 3D Mark Ice Storm, 27,124. So it's got plenty of horsepower. It does not get too hot. We didn't notice any throttling when playing games, all that sort of thing. And the, the Snapdragon 820 is pretty decent when it comes to battery life, which is a good thing because we have an even smaller battery than the LG G4 in here. We have a 2800 milliamp battery. Now, you can get more batteries and it doesn't, you don't have to have the chin with it. You can just get the battery. In fact, there are several carrier promos that are giving away cradle chargers and spare batteries for this. And, you know, the good news is you won't desperately need it. Standby times on this are fantastic. Fantastic. Very, very good. And that helps that it's running Android 6 Marshmallow with Android Doe, so it really controls background processes when the device is sleeping. When using it, it depends on what you're doing and how high the brightness level is. Again, there seems to be a reason why LG is always setting the auto brightness pretty low. If you have it set pretty bright and you're playing games or using the GPS or anything like that, you can watch it go down very quickly, a percentage point every five minutes or so. But if you're just using it to, you know, look at your email and that sort of thing, the battery life is pretty decent. So it is quite variable and screen on time measurements can even vary depending on what you're doing anywhere from three and three quarter hours if you're doing gaming a lot, or you can actually stretch it to about four, four and a half maybe. 
for those of you who aren't Android geeks and aren't usually used to measuring your actual screen on time, use time, that means that unless you're doing something like playing games or really taxing it heavily, it should last through the day on a charge. And of course you can pop in those spare batteries, even though that's become somewhat cumbersome just because this is so hard to remove now, this here thing, but you can. So let's talk again about LG Friends. God, what a name. It's like I'm almost embarrassed to have to say Friends. They're an interesting idea. We've heard of modular phones before, including Google's Project Aura and, and other phones. So I applaud LG for trying to do something different and to take the removable battery to the next level. On the other hand, it seems a bit over-engineered and complicated way of addressing a solution. I, I would have preferred things that use the USB-C port, for example, to clip on, especially given the fiddliness of having to swap the batteries. Now, we don't have the accessories available here, and they're actually they're not even in any of the stores locally we went and looked from there LG cam plus is a camera grip that has an additional 1200 milliamp battery and a little zoom wheel on it and that puts a big old hump over here in part because it has to house that additional battery so it's not the most beautiful looking thing but I suppose it does provide a place for grip the zoom wheel I'd, I'd really didn't find that idea terribly compelling myself there's also the LG hi-fi plus audio DAC which is a 32 bit DAC which is a high high quality output audio. Now there's not a lot of uh, high quality music available actually 32 bit but LG's happy to sell you some if you're interested. In fact they'll match up your collection and you get to buy it again only in higher resolution. The 360 cam is actually an external device. I'm more excited about the external devices and we'll splice in a picture of some of these guys so you can see them but that, that's a standalone little module and it's a 360 degree camera eye, a little orb so you can do kind of well obviously 360 VR panorama stuff that's kind of neat. There's another one that controls a little rolly robot which you can chase your cat around with and there's a drone controller too so there are some interesting ones that don't actually use this on the bottom and I'm more excited about them than I am about the friends and the build quality challenges they introduce and the fiddliness and I'm not sure how many people are going to take apart their phone. Some things I like about LG software is we still have knock on so you can actually just double tap the phone when it's sleeping just to take a look at the screen which is pretty handy. But why isn't that working now? Now you can probably barely see it. It has an always on screen. Even though it's an IPS LCD, they have managed to do that. And there's a little email notification in case you couldn't see it. See, so you get the time and you get the date and you get notifications as well, which is a little bit better than Samsung. It only shows you the time. Notice how quickly I just unlocked that by touching the fingerprint scanner on the back. That works very well too. You still have the multi-window multitasking and the easy screenshotting ability, right? There you can do Capture Plus and then you can annotate the screen too. You got your pencil, you got your marker, you got all sorts of stuff right there. So that's pretty nice. The, the settings is all, are also handled fairly nice. So you can have it as a list view if you want or broken out in the usual four screen that LG has been doing for a while and so was Samsung. So you've got control over all of your stuff here. We have some odd things like ringtone ID. Compose ringtones automatically based on the phone number of the incoming call. I probably would never recognize who was calling again if I use that. You can rearrange your home touchscreen buttons, control your brightness, the always on display feature that we just talked about. You can turn that off if you don't want to have that on. So that's all pretty easy to use and pretty easy to understand. Call quality on the phone is good. Again, you know, m most any phone that we've tested that is in the $400 and up price range generally has good voice quality, particularly if they're carrier offered phones, because carriers do put them through pretty rigorous tests. Call audio is loud and full, absolutely no problems there. And this has LTE 4G, of course, so you've got fast data there. And it also has Wi-Fi 802.11ac, Bluetooth, NFC, and of course, GPS. So that's the LG G5. It's available now in all major carriers. And as I said, it's a bit less expensive, but equally as noisy as the Samsung Galaxy S7 or S7 Edge. It's a fine phone. I just kind of question that the friends are going to be that useful. It is one of the selling points for this, but it's still one of the few phones with a removable battery. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full written review and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos.